today's world insight. Healthcare insurance reform in China, made urgent with the coronavirus pandemic. An eminent Chinese economist explains the ABCs of medical insurance. Yeah, we have over 42,000 people, uh, the doctors, medical personnel went to Wuhan for assistance. Dozens of potential coronavirus vaccines in sight. How close are we to a safe and effective one? Organizations like the Gates Foundation, CEPI, um, some of the companies involved are looking for partners who can manufacture the vaccine when and if it's shown to be effective. In previous outbreaks such as Ebola, in the words of a former Chinese diplomat. So I think it's my job to mobilize the local government, to mobilize the enterprises, to mobilize the people, all the society, NGO. Hello and welcome to World Inside on CGT and I'm Tian Wei. The WHO's policy-making body, the World Health Assembly, wrapped up early this week. State leaders, public health officials, and global stakeholders call for unity against the coronavirus pandemic. Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged China's contribution, including two billion U.S. dollars in aid over two years to help with COVID-19 response in affected countries, particularly the developing countries. And a potential COVID-19 vaccine in China will be made a global public good. China understands, together with many others, amid a severe public health crisis, finger pointing is not going to save lives, but potentially endanger them. So, what we need together is a real plan and a decisive action. In China, the COVID 19 outbreak took place in the middle of efforts to reform its medical insurance system. How to look after the health of every citizen with growing uncertainties? I talked to Li Ling, a professor from National Development Institute of Peking University. She's been researching about that subject for decades. Take a look. Professor Li, what a pleasure seeing you. Oh, my pleasure too. Tell me more about what the approach taken by China, since you consider Wuhan as the second hometown now, the city has been asking all its citizens to get the test. How crucial is this? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Wuhan has done a great job, uh, you know, since January. Uh, this time, they found the, after around, uh, you know, one month, they have new, six new cases. So they have uh, the universal testing. Mm. This is quite a big step. So uh, I'm kind of uh, at the mind, um, you, you know, they have uh, over 11 million people. So in yes. 10 days, the universal testing, it means every day they need a testing over a million people. Indeed. So what a workload. Professor Lee, as you may know, even the uh, special representative coming from WHO visiting Wuhan earlier, I've been talking about the great sacrifices made by the people in Wuhan. You consider it second home time. I'm sure you have a lot of empathy toward that statement. Yes, yeah, I've been, I've been very much concerned about Wuhan. I've been there in, in nine years, so I, I know Wuhan quite well. Uh, I think this time, you know, Wuhan, uh, they made a great contribution to the world battle against the COVID-19. That's in the end of, last, end of December, right? And a doctor, a doctor Zhang, I think, uh, she found the, the abnormal uh, pneumonia. So they found the problem and they reported to the CDC. Wuhan is the first to find the new virus and also the, they reported to, to the WHO mm -hmm. and also the uh, lockdown for Wuhan over two months. This is very unique. I don't think any other city can do this. Mm -hmm. And they found the result uh, against the COVID-19. We just used the uh, John Hopkins data compared with China's data. We found out, you know, uh, in Wuhan, per thousand confirmed case is only 4.49. Hmm. It's, it's around 4.5. But in New York City, 
the person that confirmed the case is 22.45, right. much higher than Wuhan. Mm. Also for the death rate, per thousand death rate in Wuhan is only 0.35, but in New York City is 0.36. Right. In terms of you know, health care system, the technology, the ability, New York City is much better than the Wuhan. But uh, from the result, we can see Wuhan did a great job. Mm. And of course, the rest of China come to aid uh, Wuhan uh, during that yes. process. Indeed, uh, we yeah. all love the yeah. doctors and the nurses uh, on the front line. Yeah, we it's have over 42,000 people, uh, yes. the doctors, medical personnel went to Wuhan to assist them. Yes, it's amazing. Having said that, though, uh, Professor Li, the reason I really want to talk to you is because you've been working very hard on how to link the crisis we're having right now to the public uh, health policy that we need to establish uh, for the future. Uh, how would you uh, untangle, shall we say, this myth for us now in China? Uh, good question. You know, uh, China started its new health care reform in 2009. It's been 10 years. And uh, we achieved a lot. We have universal health insurance now. But we have one problem in the Chinese public hospital. is uh, the doctor and the patient relationship is not improving very much mm. before this COVID-19. Uh, the reason is our public hospital actually is in name public hospital. And uh, the funding mainly from the insurance and uh, the out-of-pocket payment of patients so given this incentive, the hospital uh, could uh, over-provide the service, more mm -hmm. tests, more surgery, more medicines, and the more cost. But this, uh, you know, battling against uh, uh, the new virus, it's a, a social experiment. It's an you know, unexpected social experiment. Chinese government at the first time to promise uh, free care, you know, the insurance and the government will cover all the costs. So given this policy, we found a very unique phenomenon. It's uh, all the doctors and the patients, they have uh, un, you know, unusual harmony relationships. They are like a family, mm -hmm. and uh, they work together to get against the new virus. And also, you know, the cost to treat uh, the uh, COVID-19 is much lower than we expected. Mm -hmm. So on average, per person only spend uh, 71,000 Chinese yuan. Nowadays, in Chinese hospital, I think a normal, you know, Maybe you break your bones, it must, will, much, will cost much more than this. And so we can see, you know, given this free health care system, doctor and hospital no longer has incentive to oversupply service. Yeah. And the most important is the patients, they are trusted doctors. But Professor Lee, may I remind you, the case that you just cited, which is COVID-19, is a yes. public emergency. It is a, yes. a crisis. As you may know, at the time of crisis, things are being done in a very different way, and people are interacting with one another in a very different way. So I wonder yes. if this case is sufficient for your argument. Actually, free health care is just a, a, a name. Free health care is based on National Health Service. National Health Service is a system. This system is based on the public health, public hospital system. And this public hospital should be funded by the government. And the doctors are paid by the government. Mm. So the hospital and the doctor no longer have the incentive to make money from the patient. So that's called a free health care system. Mm -hmm. Even this system, actually, it doesn't mean you go to hospital, you pay nothing. It's just in name, it's a free care. Mm -hmm. You can have co-payment. But given this incentive mechanism, uh, the National Health Service System, so-called uh, uh, free health care, 
they put the doctor and the hospital in the right track. Right. That's but most important. Another thing people might argue, uh, Professor Li, is we had that before, right? I mean, if you look at the, the planned economy China had decades ago, it's free health care, you know, uh, in real essence. But doctors and nurses are, are not motivated to provide services. I, I should say, you know, from this uh, COVID-19 social experiment, we found out the problem is not a doctor. The problem is not a hospital. Hmm. The problem is you give doctor and hospital what kind of incentive. Before 80s, the Chinese hospital works well. It's because the government fully funding our public hospital. Hmm. From 80s to up to now, the problem is the government is no longer funding the hospital. So hospital need to make money to hmm. survive. That's the problem. So the over service actually is worse than under provide a service. And again, now actually, uh, as we uh, move on the healthcare reform, yeah. uh, we do have the way to control under provide a service because we have information system. We could uh, in time monitor the hospital doctor's behavior. Yeah. Free healthcare system is also being practiced somewhere else in the world. But some also pointed out that those systems uh, did not work very well, particularly for a prolonged period of time. People get lazy, you know, delay of treatment and a complicated process to get the so-called free health care. Uh, pr Professor Lee, how should we see um, all of these problems related to your proposal? Yes, there are, you know, the National Health Service System are the main systems in the world. Some country, you know, this system in some country function well, some country are not. Mm -hmm. It's very much dependent on the government system. So, for example, like a Hong Kong special district, like a Singapore, like a UK, actually the system functions. But especially in this uh, battling against uh, uh, COVID-19, you know, we, we shouldn't blame you know, this uh, national health uh, service system not functioning well. Actually, no health care system alone could against this pandemic. Mm -hmm. But Professor Lee, I mean, the question really is, I mean, this year's two sessions, as you may know, is going to deal with some of these problems. We have to look at the pandemic as a reality. Uh, how can we make our public health system work with this reality of a pandemic? Will free health care really be the solution, Professor? To against the pandemic, you know, we need a good health care system, but uh, we also need uh, a functioning government system mm -hmm. because this is a social movement, quantitation, you know, the isolation yes. to reduce the spread of the virus is much more important than the treatment. So uh, in the future against this, uh, you know, probably, you know, I think China need to build up a, a better, national health care system, then we can combine the public, public health, the CDC, with the hospital system, the health service system. So in this way, we could uh, you know, more quickly respond to any changes. Mm. There are a lot of talk about how public health now has become such a huge component should be of the health system, uh, but there were also argument uh, put forward uh, by, for example, retired uh, CDC officials uh, suggesting, you know, some of the latest reform over the past uh, five to ten years about the medical system and the healthcare system did not necessarily help uh, about the public health sector and probably only weakened it uh, by uh, commercial incentives. Yeah, yes, uh, in the past ten years for the Chinese healthcare reform, uh, our hospital has uh, developed very well. It's because the market mechanism is driven. But uh, as uh, I think this is uh, Dr. Zheng said, you know, the public health, government are fully funded. But uh, their salary, their, you know, their uh, fringe benefit come, cannot compare 
with the hospital's doctor. Mm -hmm. So that's why weakening the public health system. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need to treat the people. They graduate from the same medical school. So either go to CDC or you go to hospital, do the same work, mm -hmm. they should get the similar pay. Cannot you know, have a huge difference. So that's why in the future we need to combine the public health system and the public hospital, the health delivery system together. Professor, as you may know, we have uh, graduates coming from medical uh, medical sciences universities and colleges every year, huge number. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. to best use the, you know, the human resources that we have right now and make sure they are in the right place, uh, less redundancy. Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, this, uh, this is a problem. Actually, we have approximately a million people graduate from medical school especially those who uh, you know, started MD. They only want to work in big hospital, in mm -hmm. big city. So this, can, you know, this time you know, against the COVID-19, we also found our community health care center, not only public health, you know, CDC, this, uh, this sector, also the community health care center, yeah. the local hospital, we need more uh, qualified personnel, medical personnel, yeah. and uh, this is the future. We need to work on it. And actually, the key incentive one is the salary, the other is the career path. Indeed. Professor Li Ling from Peking University, a long term researcher of China's medical insurance policy. Coming up in our program, COVID 19 vaccines in the pipeline. How soon can they be rolled out? Where are we now? My exclusive interview with head of the International Vaccine Institute. A heavy task in the most unusual year. A crucial meeting with a big message. The economy, the pandemic, China-U.S. relations, and the indelible changes of the world. All take courage and resolve. Finally, a gathering for China's annual political season interviews with newsmakers and analysis about an unparalleled time. Join me on Way In Two Sessions. At the just concluded World Health Assembly, China offers to contribute to vaccine development. According to the WHO, more than 70 potential vaccines are in sight. All of them are at various different stages with the race against time to defeat the virus. But how far are we from a potential vaccine? While some are more interested in rhetorical wars rather than saving lives, what should all of us focus our attention on? Dr. Jeremy Kim, Director General of the International Vaccine Institute provides his insight. Dr. Kim, a lot of new development regarding the vaccine candidates. Which or which ones are likely to be more helpful for all of us looking at the potential? Vaccine testing in humans has three phases. Phase one, primarily for safety. Phase two, primarily to look to see whether the right protective responses are being generated, and then phase three, which is the real proof that the vaccine actually works and protects human beings and is safe. It's a little tricky because some of these vaccines are in phase one slash two, so it's hard to tell exactly where they are, but basically they're enrolling hundreds to a thousand or so patients uh, to try to see whether the vaccine is actually creating the right kind of protective responses. Right. And, you know, in the end, if it's a group from China or a group from Canada or a group from, you know, um, Korea that develops the, a vaccine, it'll be good for us, for mankind, for humankind. And, um, and I think that's the goal. Sometimes we get too engaged in the, in the race mm -hmm. and we don't kind of see that in the end we're doing this for humanity. We hope, and, we hope everybody is looking at that goal and that goal alone. Having said that, though, uh, there are... Uh, 
difficulties ahead, particularly regarding the, you know, the third stage of trials uh, that you just mentioned, uh, which would involve uh, many more people and on a much bigger scale. Uh, Dr. Kim, tell me more about that. So the third phase is actually the most kind of technically complicated and also the most expensive. Yeah. In, in that kind of uh, trial, we take a certain number of people, and, and, and the number of people is actually chosen very carefully. If we know that there's a lot of uh, COVID-19 infections going on in a country or in a city, um, we, we can actually choose a relatively smaller, um, we can do a relatively smaller trial. If we, for instance, think that the, the rate of infection is, has dropped off significantly, then we have to expand the trial. So in a trial that I did once, uh, we involved 16,400 adults. Mm. And, and that's, that's a fair number. Recently, for example, Dr. Kim, we have seen finger pointing coming from the United States toward China about the so-called uh, hacking uh, related to vaccine development. Now, there are a lot of accusations the U.S. has about China recently, almost uh, three or four every day being uh, manufactured and usually without much evidence, this time too. Uh, so, uh, so how should we understand? I'm not trying to put you into a geopolitical game because your job is not about that. Your job is a scientist. But how should we understand the ever complicated circumstances? This is just one of those examples that countries that are front runners are finger pointing at each other or at one at the other uh, trying to suggest that you are getting a, ahead because you're not doing well. But actually, realities could be a very different thing, Dr. Kim. The first responsibility of a country is to protect its people. And when, an outbreak, when the outbreak was raging in, in China or when it was raging in Korea, the response of the government was first to protect the people. Mm. And you want that. Okay. The second part of what the governments can do is that they can fund vaccine research or research in, in drugs that will help to treat people who are infected with COVID. Mm. That's the second response. Mm. All of the other things, you should consider noise. Mm. The first responsibility is to, is to protect the people. Developing a vaccine, developing new drugs, using science for the benefit of people within China, within Korea, or people around the world mm. is really the focus. Mm. We shouldn't get distracted. We should continue to work on vaccines and, and development. And we should think about how we're gonna do this together mm. rather than to think about who's gonna get there first. We're doing this for a reason. So really, remember, th there are three phases to vaccine development, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Yeah. And if we had five to 10 years uh, to make this vaccine, which we don't, the last phase, and during phase three, a company is usually building new factories or gearing up to manufacture the vaccine in significant quantity, because once the phase three trial shows that the vaccine works and you know, the regulatory agency approves the vaccine, yeah. the company wants to sell it in order to you know, recoup some of the costs to make mm. profit. We only have 12 to 18 months, which means that as we are talking now, organizations like the Gates Foundation and CEPI, um, some of the companies involved are looking for partners who can manufacture the vaccine when and if it's shown to be effective. Right. But we're going to need a, a network of these manufacturers probably distributed around the world because, I mean, in the end, 7 billion people will need yes. to get this vaccine. Yes. And it, we, what if we need two doses of the vaccine? That's 14 billion doses. Mm -hmm. No one company is going to be able to make all of that. So we're going to have to, to think now about mm -hmm. how we're going to make a vaccine available, mm -hmm. uh, how we're going to make the vaccine, and then how we're going to use the vaccine to vaccinate all 7 billion people in the world. So again, these are things, and the thinking has to start now. We yeah. don't have the luxury of five to 10 years to ponder and wonder what we're going to do when we have the vaccine. We know. If this vaccine works and it is effective, there's mm -hmm. going to be a huge demand for it. So let's start thinking about how we're going to make it and how we're going to use it equitably and give access to people around the world. Jeremy Kim, Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. While the entire world is busy with the battle against COVID-19, developing nations are hit even harder. China lost no time lending a hand to African countries. Coming up in our interview. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too by seeking answers 
to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei. Go beyond the headlines. This is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. It's not the first time that we are facing a pandemic. SARS, Ebola, MERS, one after another hit the world over the past 12 years. For the African continent, the experience against Ebola has been hard. China made a big effort to help. Ambassador Lin Songtian is a witness. He used to serve as the Chinese ambassador to Liberia, Malawi, and then South Africa. Not long after his return to China, I asked him about his Africa days. Ambassador Lin told me about those crucial days helping to fight Ebola in Africa. We are facing something unprecedented, mm. the pandemic. But this is nothing new, in fact. We have the great influenza, 1918. Mm. Even recently, there was an outbreak of Ebola mm. in Africa. Yeah. You were a key mm. person yeah. playing a role supporting Africa at that time. Tell me more about it, Mr. Ambassador. It's, it's true that the, the history of the human, I think, is the history of the fighting against the pandemic or the natural disease. Uh, in Africa, they, they suffer a lot from the malaria, HIV, mm. Ebola, and now, unfortunately, the COVID-19, the pandemic there. So I think that is the, is the nature, or the, is the human, so the, the fight between the nature and the human mm. will never stop. Mm. Mm. Earlier, you were playing an instrumental role in building a bridge between the Chinese assistance and support to Africa mm -hmm. and also those African countries suffering from Ebola. Mm -hmm. Tell me more, because now people really want to know how can we do it now. Ebola is a great case study for us to look at. Tell me more about that. Yeah, unfortunately to say in the year two, uh, 2014, when I took office as a DZ of the African Affairs Department mm -hmm. in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the first accident happened and in the world in Africa and come to me is Ebola mm -hmm. outbreak mm -hmm. in the, West, uh, the Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Yeah. And as you know, I was the ambassador of China to Liberia. Yes. So I was very shocked and I, I was the first people at that time almost there in the world to respond to that outbreak. In 10 days, uh, we are very, I'm very proud to see that the Chinese government have the first Chapter aircraft Boeing 747, mm -hmm. full of the medical supply, f arrived at, Liberia, at the capital of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and also Guinea mm. to give them the material. A kind of, a it's very important because mm. we know nothing about Ebola at that time, yeah. and they, the peop a lot of people die. So uh, we have the belief that when we call African people are the brother and sister of China, and when our brother and sister are dying, what we can do? Mm -hmm. That is the action we made. The president made a decision and we chartered not only one aircraft, but we chartered 23 aircraft and we not withdraw even one diplomat or uh, medical doctor from that area. Mm -hmm. We have three American team working in the region. We asked them to stay there, to fight together with local people from mm -hmm. beginning to the end. More than that, we, we send more than 1,000 the best medical soldiers, experts from China, from Beijing, yeah. who have had a good experience fighting against the SARS in Beijing. We send them to the affected country in the region yeah. to fight from that time to the end, you can imagine. They have won utmost respect from the African community, shall I say. But this time is different, right, Mr. Yeah. Ambassador? I mean, when Ebola broke out, it was mainly Africa. But this time, the pandemic, it's everywhere. Mm. A lot of times, the Western people, they have the capacity. They have the resources. But they close their airline. They close their embassy. They repatriated their nationals. When they close the airline, how can we help the, the affected country? 
the American and European aliens, they are also fighting against the COVID-19. They have no hand. They have no resources. They have no capacity. But now, unfortunately, they have no political will or political commitment. They even do not encourage China to support the Afghan country to fight against the pandemic. And in the peace time, we fight together against poverty for common prosperity. But now is the time for us together to fight against pandemic yeah. for our, the safe of the people. All of us would experience so many things in our life, but this is something really unprecedented. Mm -hmm. You know, how is this test likely to be answered? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Ambassador, tell me about what is your plan and also what do you think should be the right answer? The relationship and the friendship between Afghan and China, uh, we will pass the test. I think it's no problem because the only major and key partner of the Afghan country in their fight against COVID-19. And we already, from the beginning up to today, and we will work together with the Afghan country until the end mm -hmm. to win this global war against between the nature and the human. Ambassador Lin Songtian is well known for his love of the African continent and the people there. Now serving as president of Chinese Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries, a widely represented and also respected NGO in China, he's also determined to go on that journey. Mr. Ambassador, I know mm. in Africa you have a lot of friends mm. and uh, you just left South Africa. So it's tell true. me more about that. Oh, I have a lot of friends. I love Afghans so much. Sometimes I tell the Afghan people I'm Chinese <laughs> and I'm Afghan too. So I have a lot <laughs> of friends there. They are happy there because they say you are in, in one family. Mm. So in, in uh, South That's Africa, Africa yeah. that is the country. That's a nice photo. Uh, it's a good photo. Uh, we have a lot of, I took a lot of pictures there because that is a very lovely country, very beautiful country. In 1980, 1990, before we have diplomatic relations, they are quite advanced in, in infrastructure development, yeah. in economic uh, capacity. Yeah. They are very strong. So where is this? Where, where were you standing? This, you know, there, there is a small town in the beach. Uh, it's, a, it's a coastal city. It's very quiet but very developed, very peaceful. It's quite developed. Looks like uh, in Europe. Mm. They have a lot of city close to the ocean mm. and very beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, it's a, it's one of the best destinations for tourism. It's wow. a good place. The right place to yeah. have a photo. <laughs> it's true. And also their temperature is so good. Mm. Their, their, their environment, their, mm. their temperature. A lot of so tourists good. from China it's these days true. going to South Africa. It's true, and we hope to see more. Mm. Indeed. There's and, uh, one good hope. Uh -huh. Good hope. We will now understand to discover the world, the, the Afghan, the European people come to the good hope. There's that one area called uh, uh -huh. So I think that is a very good place when the people, the young yes. couple to enjoy the honeymoon holiday, that is the best place. We you hope. have become an ambassador of <laughs> Africa for China. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Uh, what about this photo you show uh, The other one I think is the, the, there's a bridge, the bridge uh, between, across the river oh. in the Republic of Congo. Uh, the Republic of Congo, not DRC, but the Republic of Congo. I think the people between the two sides, uh, 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 between the, the river, I think is uh, sometimes the communication is very difficult, mm -hmm. so they uh, request China to help them to build the bridge. We are very proud. We built a lot of bridge. Beautiful place. Uh, it's a beautiful bridge. It's true. We have African continent built a lot of railway, uh, road, right. highway, uh, school, uh, power station. So they appreciate so much. We believe. People want to see African continent sustain the economic mm. development. We need to help them to strengthen the capacity building in two ways. One is human resources development. Right. Second is infrastructure development. Yeah. Every photo you have a lot of explanation and it's a lot true. of thoughts. And mm. about, of course, uh, this is you have a lot of people here in China working in Africa and working with Africa. Yeah, I'm so proud. Every year, this is the picture. Period. I follow the. Uh, the state council of all the minister one year to pay the official visit to African country. Every year, the beginning of the every year, the first trip 
the foreign minister of China uh, pay is to African. Uh, African is become the first priority for the Chinese uh, foreign minister mm. uh, for the official visit out of China. Mm. So when I was at DZ, I followed him several years. And of course, we, me myself also traveled to a lot of the African country. Right. I visited 38 countries in the continent. Wow. Everybody mm. here in China dream of the beautiful wilderness in Africa and the beautiful nature too. It's true. Sometimes we know very little about each other. Yeah. We hope to strengthen this uh, people to people exchanges. So now when I come back to this uh, to serve in this position, I dream to do more <laughs> to, to encourage the people from China to African, African to China yeah. because the mutual understanding is very important Absolutely. and seeing is believing. Yes, indeed. Uh, well is said, believing. Ambassador. Thank you so much. Ambassador Lin Songtian, President of Chinese Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries, talking about his days in Africa. At the just concluded World Health Assembly, China announced it will put in place a cooperation mechanism for its hospitals to pair up with 30 African hospitals and speed up construction of the Africa CDC headquarters to help the continent ramp up its disease preparedness and control capacity. It's not just the Chinese government, but rather also from the private sector, the business community, from what you call the stars and also uh, some of the people from different walks of life trying to help Africa. Mm. How to mobilize mm. all of these resources in the most efficient way mm. and be able to communicate through different channels to our friends and colleagues in Africa is also crucial. I guess that's also something you've been doing, right? Yeah, yeah. With the Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. Yeah. Ah, and this is a very good question. Now I'm very proud of the Chinese people like Ma Yun. Jack Ma is a great people. I, I love, as a human being, he's a great people. And he set up the good example to the world, not only to Chinese. He chartered the aircraft to fly all the medical supplies, what they need, like the thermometer gun, like the protective suit, like the mask. This is a need material at this moment to all the country. So only Jemma has the capacity. But Jemma is not only the one rich in the world, but Jemma set up a good example to the whole world. He already donated more than two, 10 million masks to the African country, mm. cover all countries. He already donated 200 and, as I know, 2.26 million shirt and test kit to the African continent. He donated a lot of the, yeah. the, the ventilator, the protective shoes, what the needed material. And this is just some good example, as I know, even in South Africa. The Chinese community mobilized a lot. So I think it's my job to mobilize the local government, to mobilize the enterprises, to mobilize the people, all the society, NGO. Now, we already sent a lot of the calling to the local government to help not only the African continent, right. but the whole world. So yeah, I think it's a good, this is the job. Now I serve in the continent, that's one mm. thing. But now I come back in this position as a president of the association, yes. to people, to people. But of course, African is my priority. I like to open, uh, the, to build the bridge, more bridge for the Chinese people and the African people uh, to work together. Both China and African are the good brother, good friend, good partner. But the number one challenge to us is mutual understanding. Mm. We know very little about African people. The African people know very little about China because we are very far. We learn each other from the book work by the West. So I like to build more bridge or platform for the people to people to sit together, to visit each other, mutual visit, to know each other. Yeah. And that is, I think, is my mission. Mm. I like to do more. And we already opened the platform for the Chinese individuals, society, NGO, whoever likes to donate more or less to the people in the world. They are free to come to me, I come see. to this association, and we like to mobilize uh, to donate to the country who need it. The first donation I made here is to donate to the Asia and Morocco in Africa. Mm. Uh, we already have the uh, donation ceremony. And this time we are already mobilized some resources. We are about to donate to this time we go 
that's related to the African continent. I see. Mm. In terms of real essence, your relationship with Africa, many wonder. Mm. For example, some would say, what about latest incidents in Guangzhou? Uh, there were apparently accusations of racial discrimination the mm. Chinese have against Africans. Mm. Tell me, Mr. Ambassador, since you know so many people in the circle, what exactly is going on? Mm, is that, I, it seems to me, I think it's a communication issue. It's a communication issue. Why? Because some, the culture is different. The, the African people, I know them, they like their freedom, they, love the indivi they, are, they like to do what they like, but now they, they did not understand we are at the national war time against COVID-19. Mm. They like to do business as it was. But the problem also not their problem. The problem is our people, the communication, we have to tell them, we must have the patience and tell them what is it, why we need to discipline ourselves, why we need to, everybody have to self-quarantine, mm. because if everybody discipline themselves, the society, the community, the province, the city, the country will be safe. Right. So we did not communicate very well, I think. Is a problem. You know, how to make sure these people who are working on the front line understand the communication issue. Mm. That's, I think, a very daunting task, I would say, Mr. Yeah, Ambassador. Yeah, I think it's very important. So the media played a very important role, the com public com communication through the media. So the media also cover a lot of the, the exciting story, like the acting people. Now in the street, in, uh, as I know, when I was an ambassador in South Africa, there's one South African youth. Uh, he, he learned in Zhejiang province, the university, and now we are in a difficult time. He served as a doctor in the hospital. He did not choose to live. He said, no, we learn from China, we benefit from China. Now China in a difficult time, we have to fight together. We are part of this country, we are part of this city. So I'm very proud of him. He called me, I'm fighting in the street. I'm fighting in the, in the highway, or some, the, the quarantine, the test, the tem temperature. A lot of the African people, or not only the American, the, the African people, but American people also. Some people also join us to give us a hand, to work together with us. So the public communication, we also have to get them involved. Mm. To let them understand, to join our campus. Sometimes the Chinese like to, pay them as a guest. But a lot of the people, the foreigners, they like to join us as a part of that. That would be better to have the mutual understanding. They understand what we are doing, why we need to have the very strict quarantine system mm -hmm. because the, the collective security issue is there to protect the community, the city. But the communication, because the language problem, when we have such an initiation related to the foreigners, we have to have the mobilize more people and to communicate with them directly and also through the media and make good use of the media, the public education, to communication with the, right. the, each of the foreigners. Also, they have the society or association. We also need to mobilize them to get them involved to fight together with us. Yeah. That would be better. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your work and that of your colleagues. You have a great team. Thank you so much. I hope we can maintain such a good cooperation. I'm sure we will. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you so much. And that's all we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can certainly search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tianwei in Beijing. Bye. -bye.